welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast, where we're helping non-techs build great tech. Today we've got a little bit of a different take. We're joined by Craig Johns. He's also a podcaster himself, uh, 200 plus episodes on the Inspiring Great Leaders podcast. Uh, so go check that out. He's also been involved in high performance coaching in sport uh, in different areas and high performance is one of the key facets I'd like to dig in today across not just sport but corporate in early stage startup people that are driving new initiatives in industry or anything they're trying to achieve in the space of new products. Uh, Craig uh, there's a number of other areas in terms of uh, coaching and performance in corporate as well and a number of different businesses he's running but I'll let him dig into that but Craig thank you for joining us really appreciate your time. Uh, it's a real pleasure, Andrew. Uh, looking forward to giving some insights to your listeners. Thank you. Now, first and foremost, love to talk about who you are. Um, tell us a bit about your background and how, where you are today and how you got there, really. Yeah, good. Look, I grew up on a little farm in New Zealand. The nearest neighbour was a mile away. Uh, the school I went to had 28 children when I first arrived as a five-year-old and when I left as an 11 year old with one year to go of primary school there were only seven children left so we learned you know for me I, I love that that component because you had to you know, as a kid you were actually naturally leading up leading down leading sideways because we all had to help each other out and we had to um, you know sometimes you'd be accelerated in a certain subject other times you were helping someone else or when it sp- came to sport, you, you were playing with kids that were d- more than double your age. And so a really good grounding and I, and I love that aspect. Uh, but I think growing up on a farm, you know, you learned what hard work was all about. You learned about resilience and determination and grit. Um, you know, dealing with being on your own quite a lot as well, which I think really helped later on in life when it came to being a CEO, also owning businesses. <clears throat> and, and being an athlete because you know when it comes down to it you're the one who's got to deliver and there's not always someone around that can support you um, so you've got to be able to take that initiative and be comfortable in your own skin and and deal with the the voice that's inside your head so to speak that noise um, that's always going on right <laughs> yeah yeah and so you've got to be comfortable with that and I think that grounding of living on a farm being a bit isolated in a way and you know just being able to entertain and educate yourself and and deal with those challenges i think was a really valuable sort of start to life um but i was very fortunate you know my family got me into sport or or, or i found my way into sport from a very young age you know i started swimming when i was three i was you know i suppose training competitively from the ages of seven Uh, i think my first field hockey game was four and a half years because dad was coaching and i was tagging along and I was like, look, let, let me on the field. I don't think they could stop me from getting on the field. So they're all, we'll, we'll chuck a shirt on you and, and you can be officially part of the game. I'm not sure I really helped at that point. Um, <laughs> and, and it just threw myself at whatever I could when it came to sports. And you know, my both my grandparents were really good representative coaches in field hockey and cricket. So dad's side were field hockey, mum's side were all cricket. Um, and were very good at what they what they did, and were exceptional coaches who had very little education in it, but kind of learnt on the go and just had a natural instinct for it uh, as well. Um, so that yeah, kind of set me up. I played every sport under the sun you could think of, and you know then I started to have some heart problems. Um, so at the age of fifteen, I flatlined for the very first time. I um, spent time in hospital and was told to give up sport and me being determined and uh, I suppose relentless in a way, I was like, well, unless you can tell me I'm gonna die, um, I'm gonna find a way. And and within one year, I represented New Zealand uh, in field hockey and also in triathlon, so two New Zealand representative teams. And, you know, no matter when the heart played up again, which it did on multiple occasions, and I was just, you know, like, look, I'm happy to be alive today, so I'm going to do whatever I can because um, I don't want to miss a minute. That's now, a fascinating today, story to step, step into that, right? So yeah. being yeah. in the face of that adversity, really, and still stepping into it, hmm. what drove you to step into it? Was it just the love of the, the sport and just had to go back? And what was it for you? 
Yeah, look, very passionate about sport, uh, very passionate about competing and winning, um, getting better every single day. I was, you know, loved that process, you know, especially being a swimmer early on as well. You, everything's against the clock. You, you're racing yourself, you're racing the people next to you. You're always trying to get better and the clock never lies. And so it was, it was a great way for me who just loved that, that sense of improving. But also at the age of 12, I asked this question and it stuck with me for a very, very long time. And, and, and it's what drives me every single day is why aren't people healthier, happier and hungrier for success? <laughs> you know, I'd find people that are, are healthy, but they're not happy. I could find people that are healthy, but they're not hungry to do anything. Or I might find somebody who's really happy, but they're not driven to do anything. Or you can see someone who's really, really talented and gifted. And, and look, I bet I was never the most talented sport uh, athlete at all, but I was more driven than anyone else. And I was hungry and I love what I did and I made sure I was really healthy. And so that question has kind of sat with me and it doesn't matter what role I've been in, that has been the underlying purpose to everything I've done. And it's probably the reason why I love all the work I've always done and the reason I just, I I feel energized every single day. You can give me COVID and I still feel energized to kick on and do things. Um, Let's unpack that a little bit. Um, healthy, happy, and hungry for success. What do you find when working in the, the spaces that you've worked in? Obviously, high-performance coaching. You can have, like you said, the most talented person may not be hungry for success, but the most hungry person can go miles past them in terms of their ability and their performance on the day or in their performance in a career. What do you find really drives people when you go into the space of coaching? What drives people to be have that hungry hungriness that's deep inside them? Deep down, everyone wants to learn. Everyone wants to learn. The challenge is when people are naturally good at something, people tell them they're amazing, uh, they tell them they're great, you're doing awesome, you're wonderful, you're incredible, you're phenomenal. And so they start they listening. To <laughs> they get comfortable, they do. Mm. And they get complacent and complacency kills. We know that. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge, you know, so we want to cheer people on, we want them to do really well. But deep down, everyone wants to learn. And so the only way people will learn is you got to make them a little uncomfortable. You've also got to give them feedback that realizes that they're not there yet. They can do better. And so we see this quite often at school, um, you know, with parents and look, they're trying to do their best and they're trying to make them feel good. And, and you know, and it, when someone is doing something well, you want to cheer them on, but that's not where growth happens. Growth happens when people are uncomfortable, when they realize they've got more work to do, that they realize that they've they've got this talent but it's not been maximized yet and there's so many ways to do that and so once you understand that it's easy to make someone hungry for success when you know how to push those buttons in the right way um let's and, dig in on that you said it's easy to do that so i find it fascinating because even in my day to day, I've been in a business for 16 years. It's been evolving. It's, mm. There's many of them happening at the moment. It's not just one, but like similar to yourself, there's a couple of things that are occurring. But then you, you, you can hit marks where you hit complacency, but then you've got to reset and find drive again. And sometimes you get stuck in your own head. How do you bring that out of someone to continuously go at it day after day, year after year? You know, if you, you look at someone in business, you know, or, no, let's say someone's in corporate. We'll start with corporate first. Okay. You know, asking a question, are you okay with people talking over top of you and you missing out on opportunities and work, right? Mm -hmm. say, you're a, say you're a coach and, you know, you're a leadership coach or something like that. You know, are, you, are you okay with working one-to-one -one when you know there's a lot more opportunity to make an impact and make money worth one-to-many? Mm -hmm. um, if we look at, say, an athlete, you know, are you okay with just winning your regional, your regional titles when you could win a national title? So it, it's getting, it's asking those questions that are quite specific that goes, huh, you know what? No, I'm not, I'm actually not happy with that. Mm -hmm. But everyone else is telling them, yeah, you're great. You're amazing. You've done it. Yeah, you're awesome. But you just need someone who can ask those questions. And then you can ask them, you know, how would it feel? 
how would it feel if you could coach one to many and make a bigger impact and earn more money? You know, how would it feel if no one talked over top of you and you could speak for yourself and people really stood up and listened to you and opportunities came from that? How would it feel? You know, uh, you know. So, so you can see where I'm going here. It's, yeah, I get it. It's barking yeah, those questions. Those type as well. of questions that mm-hmm. you've got to create agitation in, internally. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of co- there's a lot of people out there who can create agitation back towards them. <laughs> so we can agitate <laughs> someone, but it's back towards them or about someone else. But when you can truly deeply agitate someone internally, and they can feel it comes from a really kind caring heartfelt place far out it, this it's amazing what people can do uh, and you've got to be there to support them because if you are going to agitate them internally mate they're going to have a bit of a struggle for a while and you've got to be there to support them during the struggle not to wrap them up on cotton wool but to support them and encourage them to go to say look you've got this you know and we all know that when we when we make a change because when you agitate someone internally, you're literally cutting the wires in the brain a little bit because they're used to doing something. They've been doing something for a long time. They're comfortable doing something a particular way. They're comfortable. Way, right? So we've got to break that wiring. And when you rebuild wiring, sometimes you'll go up and then you might come down. You go up and you might come down. So it's a bit of a roller coaster when you do get someone to make that shift. But you've got to figure out what buttons to push and, what, and to ask those questions that will agitate someone internally. And it's all contextualized. Um, as well that's if you want someone to to continue to drive forward versus someone who just goes through the motions yeah it's a it's a fascinating piece and it, you see that in the context of people building technology and trying to do new things um, I'm involved in startup scale up corporates all facets of it and I find it quite fascinating as to some of the people that just go to the well a little bit and find a bit of a pushback and then they're off back to their normal job. <laughs> so I find it fascinating. We, how do we build resilience when we we know that there's comfort on the other side? Sometimes people say you've got to burn the boats and let it go. But um, how do you build resilience when you know that you're sort of stuck in your old ways? And I find that fascinating. Some people can and some people can't. Uh, look, I've not seen a successful person who's done it on their own. You've got to have the right people around you. You've got to have your mentors, your coaches. You've got to have those people that can have your back when you're against the wall, but you've also got to have those people that will give you the encouragement and that ability to agitate you. You know, if your mentors and coaches aren't agitating you internally, then they're the wrong people for you. They're the wrong people for you, unfortunately. And so you've got to have those right people that surround you. Um, and they do need to make you feel a little bit angry, but they'll, it, it's not an anger against them. It's not an agitation against them. It's an agitation, and anger of, with yourself. Cause you know, you know what? I've got more, I can do better than this. And so you've got to be able to create that. Now you, it, you, a great thing you just brought up there around, you know, we have this great vision or this dream and we drive or we, we, we start to go down then we kind of, we get close to going across the line to really go where we need to go to really make that push and then we back off. And so I'm gonna share something around high performance because in most cases, we've had a big sort of boom around this high performance thing. Everyone's talking about high performance. This is high performance, that's high performance. And what most people share is just base is the fundamentals for a being performing or having a performing team, but not high performance. So let's let's take What's a look. definition of high performance first. Let's talk about that because everyone's probably got a different definition. What's your definition of high performance? Yeah, well, performance. Like, let, let's look at performance first, right? So, if we're performing, we're performing at a like at a level that's that's really good. Mm-hmm. But high performance is that ability to go above and beyond. You know, if we if we look at Let's say Formula One right now. I'm not sure if you're into cars, but Formula I'm One. Not into cars at all, but let's go there. <laughs> yeah, all right. So let's talk about Formula One. You've got literally the 24 or, or let's say 20 hottest drivers in the world right now. Now, they've got high performance cars. Some of them are not high performance cars because they're, they're struggling a little bit, but, but in general, they're high performance cars. Now, you've got some amazing athletes there, but when I watch them drive, 
throughout a season, there's probably only a few that are really at high performance level. The rest are good. They perform well, but they don't have that ability to, to change the game. They don't have that ability to, and, and that's a key thing here. So change the game is really critical. Um, if you're not willing to change the game in whatever pursuit you're doing, then you're unlikely to be pushing into a high performance zone. Okay. All right. So you'd be willing to change now. So let's have a look. Um, the All Blacks, so rugby. So All Blacks rugby, the most winningest team ever in sport. They Their winning percentage uh, on average is around just under 80%, so around 78%. To give you an idea, the nearest sort of teams are like Manchester United, which are about 58%. So it gives you an idea of the it's, league. It's a crazy, yeah. Where difference. they sit. It's yes. incredible. And when we look at the All Blacks, their longest winning streak is only 23 games. Only, but it's a lot still. <laughs> it doesn't right. tell it's us much. It's extremely difficult yeah. To, yeah. to sustain high performance level where you're ahead of the game all the time. Now, mm. the reason why they have been so successful, it's a country of only 5 million people against some really big countries, is that they're, they have always been focused on being five years ahead. They're like, what? How do we? How is the game going to look in five years' time? Now, the last couple of years, they probably haven't done that very well, and so other teams have got ahead of them. But when they were in that that focus, they were winning all the time. Now, I was very fortunate to be part of New Zealand's most winningest sports teams. It was a Stratford Premier Men's hockey team, and the record may even be a world record. I don't know. We haven't been able to find anyone, any other team that has been able to achieve this level. And we went 272 games unbeaten. Wow. That's 16 years straight. Uh, in fact, they only lost one game in 21 years. Now, to give you a bit of context, I said I lived on a I farm with the nearest neighbor a mile away. Yeah, wow. The Stratford only had 5,000 people. Now, we would beat teams of cities of over 100,000. Um, they even combined, like the, the biggest city combined three clubs together to try and beat us. Never did. Wow. Never until, did. <laughs> until, this, until right at the end when they finally, finally got us. And I think that uses a hell of a long streak. That's, yeah, yeah. It, it's incredible, yeah. right? So I played, I never lost a game for that team. Um, and then they went on to win, you know, I, knew, I was there for the first five years of their 16 years. Um, so something that's unique inside of there, and I'll come back to you, we're talking about having kind of a vision, a dream, a goal they're chasing. What performing teams and companies have as a vision? They have a really strong vision, but they don't have a minimum standard that is acceptable. And so when we look at teams like the Stratford men's team, or we look at the All Blacks, and it's very consistent, we can see this in some of the most high performing corporate teams as well, is that they have a, a vision, they have kind of a couple of components to it. So they have, yes, they have the big, hairy, audacious goal. Now there's two parts to that part. There's the positive side. So it must have positive, there must be a positive performance angle to it so that you can feel driven towards that. It's a, uh, you can, measure it as well but they oh, also the have vision what... or big hairy audacious goal which is the vision in a way like it's, yeah, it's okay. a similar thing right so similar we think thing. it's just giving people a bit of context there so think about the big vision you know what is that big vision the big dream and but they also have a negative vision to it right and so people negative is maybe not the right word but it's the term that was sort of put in there when the research was done by the All Blacks, um, or one of the All Blacks, David Kirk, he was their first World Cup winning um, captain back in 1987. He did some work with McKinsey. And they talked about the negative vision. Now, what that is, is the minimum standard the team will accept. Now, if you only have the positive vision, what happens is when things get a little challenging, it's really easy to sit back into what we've always done. Okay, it's very easy to slip down into the standard of comfortable complacency again. So having that negative vision means what is the acceptable standard? Now for our team and the Stratford men's team, our minimum accepted standard was a draw. That was minimum. You didn't lose. Like there was no losses. Like we, we weren't going to accept 30% losses. No, our minimum standard was a draw. And even then we were pissed off. 
I, I, for us. And there were times where we only just got that draw in the last minute of the game, I can tell you too. <laughs> but we knew how to fight for that. And so we had that component, but you also need to, I think every individual needs to know what is their, so the third component is what the individual needs to know what is their contribution to that vision and what are they getting out of that, that collective vision for themselves. So we need to look after both self-worth and collective worth when it comes to the vision. So if we don't connect our individuals in that company, in that team to the vision, and they don't feel a connection to that helping their own vision, then they're not going to be determined and they're not going to show up every single day. So you've got to be able to find that. But that negative vision is the real key point that people miss. And when you've got that and you've anchored that in and everyone knows it and can hold you accountable, you don't let standards slip. That's interesting. Well, I've never heard about a negative vision in my mind. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard that mm. philosophy. I think the buy-in to the vision, I've heard that in certain realms, is how do we get people to buy in and actually own a vision and not just put it on a wall and walk past it and everyone just forgets about it, just goes about their day-to-day. -day. But yeah, the negative vision side, is that framed into the vision itself or is that a different piece that you see? Just Look, you don't, Yeah, the, you don't write it into the vision. Yeah but you, when you're creating it or when you're, maybe when you're reassessing the vision or the strategy every sort of three or four years or whenever that may be, then as a collective, you need to then come together and go, okay, what's our minimum standard? Mm -hmm. what, what is it that we are all agreeant on that we don't drop below? What does that look like? And so it's not gonna be written into your vision, but it's gonna be something that you have created together. Now, Good. this helps, because what happens, right? If, if you've got a startup company and you're, or, or you're, you know, maybe you've got, you're at a point where you're scaling up and you bring everyone together and go, all right, time for a new vision. Everyone that was there at that time gets input and feels like they've had some, uh, some level of interaction in regards to creating that vision. They're buying, they'll buy in. Like it's easy for them to buy in. So the ways to get people, new people coming in is to make sure that you know when you do some is that you sit down with them and go okay here's our vision what's your vision how can we help support yours through this vision and so if there's no match then it's probably not going to last um, but also creating like revisiting that minimum standard every couple of years also helps to bring that buy into the big vision as well so i think that helps the other thing is making it simple i think many visions and missions are very uh yeah, you know, they're too long, <laughs> they're too abstract. Yeah. Yes. You can't remember them. Like mm -hmm. for us at Speakers Institute Corporate, if we even look at our, uh, so if we look at our vision, right? To be the global leader in corporate training. Really to, simple, to easy to catch. Now our mission, even easier, to inspire great leaders. That's our mission. Mm. And our tagline is inspiring great leaders. Like really, really easy to remember. And so it may not fit the standard, you know, like what people say, this is how your mission should look. It may not quite fit that. However, if you can't remember it, it's a waste of time anyway. Yeah, if so, no one's buying into it or even understands it. I think one of the, the I learned this from, um, I would say, a, a good a business partner in some capacity in some different areas, but from a vision perspective, and even across standards, one thing that they've taught me, so similar in sort of performance coaching and training, was you need to understand what a, a vision or a, a means to the other person on the other end. Yes, you might say that this is the vision, but what does it mean to them? What is the bind for them and how do they perceive it uh, so they can actually attach to it, not just this is the vision. Um, yeah. So I found that interesting. How do we align people to a vision? And it's probably getting their meaning behind what it actually is rather yeah. than just what you're pushing down to them. So um, that's something I've learned on the rest of the journey has been quite helpful in our business. Yeah, really important, I think. And, and the biggest thing is being able to visualize. Can the person, can, can you paint a picture in the mind of that person? Can they actually see what it looks like? Because um, so if it's abstract, they're not going to be able to see it. And if you think about change, right? So... A vision is change, like we're changing the way we do things to achieve something. That's that's the direction we're going. It's part of the change. It's the it's the vision of what the future looks like. And um, so, if we think about athletes that are going to the Olympics, so if we've got Michael Phelps when he was seven years old, he did not visualize being a doctor. He did not visualize 
um, sweeping the streets. He did not visualize, you know, being the clown in the circus. He did not visualize working at KPMG or Google. He visualized standing on that podium with a gold medal around his neck at the Olympic Games. Now, he went on to uh, get 28 medals, I think it was, and 22 or 23 gold medals. Eight, eight, and, eight out of eight and one Olympic Games, I think it was 2008. It so, was amazing, <laughs> that particular year. Yeah, but he could visualize that. So when we think about, like, if we come back to the basics, as leaders, we are change managers. All leaders are change managers. All CEOs are change managers. And to be quite honest, pretty much every single person in this world is a change manager. I've got to influence my 21-month baby girl. So I, every day I'm influencing change. So there's lots of things out there that'll tell you this is what creates great change and this will make it successful. But in the end, it comes down to three basic things. If you don't have these, it's not going to happen. One, urgency of change. So if you think about our vision or or a goal, or we're selling something to someone, or we're trying to get someone to think differently, what is the urgency? Because if we can't see any urgency, we've got a oh, great idea, but we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing. You know, this is good. It's easier to keep doing what you're doing if there's no urgency, I agree. Oh, yeah, it's when there's comfortable. Something right, so when there's a, it's like a pro, major problem smashes you, or a challenge right in the face, yeah. <laughs> and you walk straight into it. Urgency is yeah. right there, because you have to move. Yeah. But creating yeah. urgency sometimes can be a little bit difficult for people. It's like, if I've got a vision out there, how do I drive urgency when I know there is none? So that's, that's a kicker. But you've got to create it, because if there's no urgency to do it today, then they'll go, okay, I'll wait till next week. I'll wait till next month. And they don't do it, right? Yeah, so Years go by. Mm. Years go by. Um, so you've got to get people to be able to create that sense of urgency, build that case around the problem, the pain point we're solving, um, even think about the opportunity in the future. And if there's an opportunity, there's always a problem or a pain point associated with it. There always will be. Because there's an opportunity. If we don't do it now, we're going to be left behind because other businesses will take that opportunity if you think about it from a startup. Yep. So that'll be a problem because you're not gonna have business in three years time because everyone else has moved ahead and so have consumers and especially in tech startups far out, the game's changing all the time. Yeah, like, you've you've gotta be evolving new. all the time. Yeah. All right, so you got sense of uh, urgency of change, number one. Number two, clarity of change. If it's not clear, if it's not specific and easy to understand, people are not gonna change. It's gotta be really, really clear. And if we think about the most influential, inspirational leaders of, of all time, they're really easy to understand. They speak in a language of a eight to 12 year old. Like it's easy, right? And so what happens in life is we try and add all these extra words, we make things complex, we, we try and add technical words to think we're intelligent, when in fact we're not. And if we're not clear and not understood, then there's a problem. It, it creates a barrier in the mind. And, and human beings will give you grace for the first barrier, right? Like your, your first barrier, yeah, okay, I'm still here. Second barrier, they'll take a step back. Third barrier, they're gonna, t they're gonna be already on their phone or they're already gonna be thinking about what's next. They might be in the room or might be there, but they're not actually listening to you anymore. They've switched off. So that clarity of change, so that's number two. And then the third one is visualize the change. If our job as leaders and influencers is to put a canvas inside the listener's head or our team's head and then become Picasso. And you need to paint this beautiful picture of what the future's gonna look like. You know, if, if people can't see it, they're not gonna believe in it. And then they're definitely not gonna follow it. And so that's why story is so important. The ability to tell stories really well, the ability to paint pictures quickly, um, you know, in a way, so really powerful. Um, and I think that's so critical. We, a lot of people talk about the importance of storytelling. Yep. It's really important. We've got to be yeah, doing everyone, storytelling, everyone does. Is but, but why don't you do it? Why is there something, is there something you'd recommend for people that would go out there that are looking to learn around how to tell better stories? Are there certain things that you picked up along the journey? Yeah, it, look, it is. It is, it's like anything, if you don't practice it, you're gonna be uncomfortable. If you don't yeah, practice it, you're gonna be clumsy. So mm -hmm. you've gotta get some time practicing it. My recommendation too is to get a coach who can teach you how to do it as well. You know, cause yes, we can read a book, 
that's a story, but it's not going to yeah. make us someone who's good at telling stories. Now, some are very good naturally, but yes. it's, a, it's a teachable skill and it is so critical, so critical. Um, we wonder why as parents, we have our three-year-old kid come up to us and uh, you can see they've done something wrong and you explain to them go, about how to do it right. And they go, yeah, yeah, and they go away and do the same thing again. Why? Because you haven't visualized what it looks like. They don't know what it looks like. And adults are the same. We, we're no different. Um, so those three things are really critical. If you don't have those, then you're really going to struggle when it comes to change. I mean, if you want to add a fourth bonus one in there, then you've got to tap into the emotions. And if you know how to tell a story well, you will know how to evoke emotion. Mm -hmm. And so part of the visualize the change, you also need to um, evoke emotion in the person to to want to change as well. So it's, it's probably the fourth bonus one, but there's no point doing that unless you got the first three right. It's hard to drive emotion if there's nothing backing it up in the, behind it. So it becomes a bit difficult, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. correct. Oh, brilliant. Um, Craig, fascinating. Talk about your Inspiring Great Leaders podcast for a couple of minutes. Give a bit of a plug. And I'm sure there's quite a number of different stories on there. But why do you do it? What do you love about podcasting? Yeah, good. Look, you know, I've been podcasting now, I think, for six years. I think it's coming up six, maybe seventh year now. Um, you know, had a couple of breaks in between where work got just overwhelming and I couldn't keep okay. up. Um, so, you know, the last two months I haven't been able to release them, even though I've got a whole lot backed up. So, you know, finally back releasing them last week, which is really, really good. Uh, for me, I, it actually started out as the active CEO podcast and, but I found the people, some of the people I wanted to interview were like, well, I'm not active. Um, I don't belong on this podcast. So I decided to change the name and to inspiring great leaders. And, you know, so we have people from world champions, Olympic champions and coaches through to uh, someone who's doing incredible not for profit work to uh, people that might have, you know, like there was a, I can't think of the guy's name, it's got on top of my head. Um, but they had co-CEOs in a company. So I wanted to understand how co-CEOs worked um, to coaches, thought leaders, consultants, uh, small business owners. You know, really, I just want to unpack stories of people who do some incredible things, but don't realize probably how amazing they are and to bring those stories to life and to help educate people. Um, and, and I suppose the, the byproduct of that is I get to learn every single day off incredible people that it's a fascinating piece yeah. that learning people don't get that right so yeah. the learning is the fascinating piece so it's a yeah. it's a half an hour hour of learning so yeah. um, there's incredible oh, people yeah. i have unearthed from all around the world and yeah. uh you realize that there's so much more to do in the world and you know sometimes you think look i've lived a pretty good life and then you hear someone else and go Man, you've had some ups and downs, but your life sounds pretty amazing too. I'd, I'd love to have a go at some of that. So uh, I think, you know, for me, it just, it fuels me. I just love people coming alive when they talk about their journey and their lessons and, you know, what they have understood in their life. And I think for everyone listening as well is to realize that we're all, you know, we're all ordinary people. And, but every single one of us has done something extraordinary along the way. You probably just don't realize it sometimes and so that ability to get uh to interact at a human level with people that sometimes may look like they're a closed shop or th that might be too difficult to get a conversation with and so for me i just yeah i find joy in just being able to open up those conversations to people who may not have the courage or confidence to go and ask someone like that to to share some insights and and some of their expertise oh, oh, brilliant craig it's uh Fascinating to hear from you and learn about your background, your history, um, high performance coaching, training, playing uh, professional sport. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. We could probably go for hours, but our podcast goes for about 30 minutes, so we'll probably cut it there. Um, I'll share out your links to Inspiring Great Leaders. I think that's a, a great initiative. So people go have a listen to Craig um, and the interviews that he's doing. And so there's plenty to learn, I'm sure, from someone like yourself and the experience that we had. But really good to unpack a couple of things and how we can drive high performance within in the space of a family, a business, a startup, a corporate, whatever it might be, but distilling what that might mean. So thank you for coming on and sharing uh, a bit of your experience and probably just the, the top of the iceberg or that tip of the iceberg, but thank you for coming on today. No, you're welcome. A real pleasure. Thank you.